Well, one of the distinct voices in baseball is now silence. And it's going to be strange moving forward. You are Locked On MLB, your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, baseball fans, and welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all the Major League Baseball. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. If you don't believe me, there's my lower third. You can call me Sully. I have been a baseball podcaster for a long time, and I am now... Well, I'm now in my sixth season here as a host of the Locked On MLB podcast, where it is your team every day. Let you know today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I'll admit it, I have a competitive side. And it makes me a big fan of Monopoly Go, which is the mobile hit twist on the classic Monopoly game. So join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now free, the App Store or on Google Play. You can follow us at Lockdown MLB Pods on Twitter, or whatever it's called now. Uh, and uh, you can follow us on Instagram, same handle. I'm your pal, Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. And if you are listening to us every single day, can you just please, 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 I'm begging you, put that hashtag every day, Sully. And we can, uh, you know, we figure out who is doing what. Hey, um, this happens every once in a while. I make a slight mistake in the trivia questions. I come up with the trivia questions, and I realize the way I word it sometimes is more than one answer. And I found that out when I asked the last one, which was, what city that has hosted three World Series, at least three World Series, has seen every World Series that they've hosted go the full seven games? Now, I will tell you something. Uh, someone, Someone put down... Uh, Washington, because the new Senators were in the 24 and 25 World Series that went seven games, and the 2019 World Series went seven games, but the 33 World Series only went five. Well, I'll tell you, I realized there was a record scratch. Scott Horsmeyer said the answer that I was thinking of, which was Milwaukee, which the Braves won the the. 57 World Series in seven games against the Yankees, lost the 58 World Series in seven games against the Yankees. The Braves left, the Brewers showed up, and the only World Series the Brewers have gone to went seven games where they lost to St. Lou. But wait a second, stop the presses. Court Stell brought up and reminded me that the Twins, Minnesota, Minneapolis, I guess I'm getting away that he said that uh, the old Metropolitan Stadium was in Bloomington, so maybe that's he thought I was being pedantic there. Um, Minneapolis uh, had the 87 and 91 World Series at the Metrodome, and the Bloomington uh, uh, Metropolitan Stadium hosted the 65 World Series. All those went seven games. So, um, sure, I was being pedantic, but you know, both of those are correct, I guess. So I made a mistake. Sometimes it turns out. Uh, I, I got too cute. I got too cute. So there you go. Um, John Sterling retired today. I'm just going to just jump right into it. John Sterling has been the voice of the New York Yankees since he first joined on in 1989. And which is, by the way, I moved to New York in 1990. And it's funny that when I went there, I didn't really care for this new voice, John Sterling, on the radio. And I was mainly interested in hearing Phil Rizzuto. Now, Phil Rizzuto was the announcer of the Yankees for many, many years. And he was the announcer that my mom listened to. As my mom grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut, listening to Yankee games with Phil Rizzuto listening to him, you know, announcing him. And when I listened to Phil, I felt the connection to my mother because there was a direct connection between the Yankee games that were called in the late 50s after Phil retired, uh, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, and the same voice that my mom was listening to was the voice that I was listening to. There was a direct connection. And John Sterling was new. Now, a lot of people felt that Phil went off the rails and said crazy things, but that was one of the reasons why I loved him. 
because he would go off on crazy tangents. When I got there, when I went to New York, the Yankees were bad. And so Phil had lots of reasons to get distracted. And it was a great connection that I could listen to him and laugh and just hear. He was like your crazy old Italian uncle, you know, blathering on during a game. And it was a lot of fun. Well, with John Sterling retired, he's been there through the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s, and now halfway through the 2020s. He's been a Yankee announcer about as long as Rizzuto was the announcer. That's mind-boggling for me to think about, but that's actually true. And for many, many people who grew up in, in the tri-state area rooting for the Yankees or listening to on their devices, Sterling is as much to their Yankee fandom as Rizzuto was to my mom's and to mine. Or I'm not a Yankee fan, but you know what I'm saying. And so when you hear that voice doing the it is high, it is far, and coming up with the crazy names, if you're a Yankee fan who's been there all this time, he has been a connective tissue. He hasn't been for everybody. Not everyone has loved his calls and everything, but he was a fan favorite. And it became this weird sort of game of what's what is he gonna call when there's a new player? What are they gonna what are they gonna how is his home run gonna call gonna be for him? And the fact that some of his home run calls were pretty funny and some of them were genuine swings and misses is kind of the point. He's got to come up with something for everyone and not everyone's going to be, if you will, hit out of the ballpark. And for people who were didn't like Sterling because he didn't know a lot about analytics or sometimes he would go off the rails, I thought he matched very well with Susan Waldman. It was kind of like your your quirky uncle and your fun aunt were watching a game with you. And it was clear the two of them genuinely liked each other. Some of the things that they said, yeah, they weren't paying attention to the game, but think about yourself when you're watching a game. Are you always talking about the game, especially when it's a dud? I loved listening to Sterling and Walden when it was a Yankee blowout, either way, because they're just going to go off and talk about something else, kind of the way you do at a ballpark. The ideal part of a announcer is they have to be someone who it's less about the description of the game and more about someone you want to hang out with during the game. They're not just there to describe the events. They're there to be your friend watching the game with you. Now, there are people who never cared for what he did. I get it. It rubbed me the wrong way as a Red Sox fan here. And it is high. It is far. But an announcer, especially when they're there for a long time, becomes that connective tissue. If you're a Yankee fan, think about he started in 89. Okay. And that was 35 years ago. Going by the rule of seven, if you're in your 40s, okay, he's the announcer that you remember. And if you're someone in your 40s and you have a kid in, who's a teenager, you can listen to the games and, yeah, that's the same announcer I was listening to. And it helps create that sense of timelessness or that illusion of timelessness. That's what we had here in Los Angeles County with Vin Scully, which until he stopped announcing, there was still a connection to Brooklyn. That's so what listening to Kruko and, and Kuiper uh, doing the Giants games. When my dad may risk his people wanted to hear a Giants game, he'd say, put on Crook and Kite, put on Crook and Kite. Because he's, they are the people who you watch the games with. They are your companions. I grew up with Ned Martin and his rotation of co-hosts. It was sometimes Bob Montgomery. It was, uh, it, you know, sometimes it was Ken Harrelson. You know, Joe Castiglione was matched up with this and that and the other thing. You know, Joe has been around since the 80s, so if you're listening to Red Sox games, there's a connection there. Having that connection, t connective tissue is part of the experience of the game. And there are fabulous announcers going on right now. Jason Benetti, who was the announcer of the White Sox, is now the announcer for the Tigers. I hope he's the announcer of the Tigers for a, for a generation and that they can have uh, – you can have that connection right there. Hey, Buccaneer Bruce, who's listening to us right now, says that Denny Matthews here in Kansas City. Exactly. Denny Matthews has been there forever. 
And so if you're listening to old games, it's the same announcer. The late, you know, uh, Carlos Ortiz is not a not a Yankees fan growing up in New York. He was one of the great voices in New York baseball. On the Mets side, it was Bob Murphy, Ralph Kiner, and Lindsey Nelson. Exactly. And some of those, Bob Murphy and all of them, were there forever. So you heard the original Mets broadcast, and you heard them right into the 90s. That's an important part of the game. They aren't just there to describe it. They're there to be the people you sit and watch a game with. They become your friends. And I'm going to miss John Sterling. Am I going to miss all of his calls? No. No. And some of them, you know, like when Eric Hinsky hit a home run. Hinsky with your best shot. Okay, that was a that was a that was a Mark Reynolds hit one. It's a Reynolds rap. Yeah, some you know, sometimes they were groaners, but that that became part of the charm. You know, it's an A-bomb from A-Rod was kind of funny. The original one was Burn Baby Burn with Bernie Williams, but uh, without a doubt, the greatest one was Robinson Cano. Robbie Cano, what do you know? And I actually, one of my favorite moments listening to a Sterling Waldman uh, game was when uh, Cano hit a home run when he was with Seattle against the Yankees. And when uh, Cano finished rounding the bases, Susan Waldman just under her breath said, Robbie Cano, what do you know? But the two of them genuinely, genuinely liked each other. You can hear it. And I mean, it wasn't always super friendly. Or sometimes you could cut the tension with a knife. But do you know what? You're going to miss that voice. Some new voice is going to come in and inevitably do a terrific job. Michael Kay, I think, has done a really good job. His former partner on the radio, I think he's done a fabulous job on TV. I think Michael Kay is going to be the next great voice of the Yankees, and there'll be another great radio voice. But do you know what? It's a unique voice he had. It's certainly one where you didn't have to ask, which one is this? Who is this? And whenever you have a unique voice, that's something worth saluting. So good luck, John Sterling. Come back. We're going to talk about power rankings, which is a new thing we're going to be doing here on the show and taking stock of where teams are right now. You know, I've been told I'm a competitive person, but, you know, maybe that's true. I don't like to be wrong. When I am and I'm caught, like the Otani thing, you know what? I'll admit that I'm wrong, but most of the time I want to be right and I want to win. All right, fine. I got a competitive side. And my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist of Monopoly where you play not one, not two, but on hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part for me is messing with my friends. I'm that kind of a guy. I could charge them rent on my iconic properties, just like Monopoly, but now I can rob their vaults of riches for myself. And the leaderboard show me who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. But it's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends and people from all around the world in time tournaments, turn huge rewards. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go, now free at the App Store or at Google Play. Let's hear from our friends from Game Time. You know what game time is? I'll tell you exactly what game time is. It's the best way to get tickets because there's so many great things to get tickets for. Hockey playoffs are starting soon. NBA playoffs are starting soon. There's great comedy, great theater, great baseball going on. Game time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the game time app usually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, and view from the seats, and their lowest price guaranteed, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. They got zone deals where you could save even more when you choose a section and let Game Time select the seats. All in prices. You go to get this feature on Game Time, no hidden fees. That's the price that you pay. It's the lowest price guarantee. Game Time will credit you 110% the difference if you find a better deal. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKDOWNMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-M-L-B. Almost forgot how to spell it. For $20 off, download the Game Time app today. Last-minute last tickets, lowest prices, they're guaranteed. Hey! 
Sports fans and football fans, it's time for Locked On's NFL Mock Draft live on April 17th at 7 Eastern Time, streaming on the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channel app. Find the ultimate six-episode series on April 17th at 7 Eastern Time to hear who the local Locked On experts are picking for every NFL franchise with live reactions from local college football experts and even the fantasy football angle. The Locked On NFL Mock Draft is on April 17th at 7 Eastern Time, streaming live at Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channel app. All right, we're going to do a new thing here, which is the Locked On hosts have been polled to see how we rank the teams 1 through 30. And at this point, of course, this is like the first checkpoint a couple of weeks into the season. And this is going to be malleable throughout the season. It isn't necessarily who has the best record, but who we think is the strongest team at this point. And I'm going to go through, I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can. Again, this, we pulled the locked on hosts, including me. I put in my two cents. I don't agree with all the rankings here, but let's go. Number 30, the worst team in baseball right now, uh, the White Sox. Um, I'm not convinced they're going to win another game. They can't hit. They actually had decent pitching today, but they're terrible. Um, the Marlins are horrific at this point. They made the playoffs last year. The Rockies are at 28. The Nats are at 27, which I, I actually don't, I think that's a little too low for them. And the A's are 26. By the way, I'm still hosting Locked On A's this week. There's no permanent host of Locked On A's. Who knows? It might be me for the rest of the year. I might be the Sacramento of the Locked On A's podcast. The fact that the A's have won three series in a row uh, and against a couple of decent teams, I would put them a little further up. They're only two games out of first place. I know it's early, but still. Uh, 25, you have the Cardinals. Um, 24, you got the Mets. The Mets won today and uh, a big game against the Pittsburgh Pirates. Who knows? They could wake up. They're a talent on the team. 23 is the Angels, which I think is strange because they've actually been playing pretty well. And Mike Trout has woken up. He had another terrific game. He might be mad with Otani gone and saying, let's do something here. Plus, that division stinks right now. Uh, the Giants are at 22. The Mariners are at 21, and the Red Sox, who somehow still have a winning record, I have no evidence to see why they have a winning record, but they're at 20. So that's your bottom third right there. So let's take a look at the middle third. The Twins at number 19. Not sure I 100% agree with that. I'd have them a little bit lower. And the Blue Jays at 18. The, you know, by the way, I called for the firing of John Schneider, and you've noticed that the Blue Jays haven't lost since. You're welcome, Canada. Uh, 17, you have the Astros, and I think that's kind of sort of right, at least how they're playing right now. The Astros, who I went in going to starting the season, think they were going to be terrific. Um, they're 6 and 12 right now, and they got clobbered by Atlanta. Bummer got the win. Uh, bummer is the best way to describe how the Astros' season is going so far. 16, you have the D-backs, who, lest you forget, were in the World Series last year. 15, you have the Tigers, lest you forget the team I picked to win the Central. And 14, you have the Reds. Might be a little high, in my opinion, but who knows? Jeff Carr from Locked on Reds, I know, had put his two cents in there. 13 is the Padres. Uh, again, some of these I'm not in agreement with. The Cubs and Rays make up 12 and 11. And then we go to our top 10. At number 10, you have the Philadelphia Phillies, who have a ton of talent, who have had some missteps along the way so far this year, but they won a walk-off game against the Rockies, and heck, if you they now climbed above 500, and I think they still have the talent to make great uh, progress. Remember, I picked them to win the World Series. Hey, uh, uh, Buccaneer Bruce, your Royals are at number nine. And lest we forget, I mean, the Royals beat up the, the White Sox today. Seth Lugo has been, so far, the best pickup so in the, in baseball this year, with the exception of Juan Soto. Number eight of the Rangers, I think that might be a little high, because uh, the Rangers, yes, they're in first place, but they've not been playing great baseball. They did win today against the uh, Detroit Tigers, one nothing. Lorenzen came up, pitched his first game as a member of the Rangers. Uh, the Guardians, you know, break up the Guardians. They're, they're at number seven. They beat the Red Sox in the Patriots Day game. 
in a 6 nothing shutout. The Red Sox bats were dead, but maybe give credit to Cleveland as they are 11-5 and right now. Um, one of my favorite teams to watch right now are the Pittsburgh Pirates at number six. They lost to the Mets. Uh, Roldis Chapman was terrible, but the and the Pirates blew a big lead. But the Pirates are still an 11 and six team in a very winnable division. And let's go for our top five right now. At number five, you have the Baltimore Orioles who beat up the Twins. Kimbrel actually got the save, and the Orioles are now 10 and six team that I picked to win the pennant is starting to look like a pennant winner. At number four are the fabulous Milwaukee Brewers. They lost to the Padres today, but they've been just red hot with their bats and with their pitching. I think they look terrific so far. At number three, you have your Atlanta Braves. You are if you live you know, below the Mason-Dixon line, and they wound up winning against the Astros 6-1, to one, and they're back to having a solid record. They're 10-5 right now. And to no surprise, the top two teams – you got the L.A. Dodgers, who, uh, despite the fact my dear friend Jessica was at the game to see Glasnow get his first loss as a Dodger, 6-4 against uh, Washington. The Dodgers look great. And lo and behold, you have the Yankees, who lost to the Blue Jays. They lost, uh, they, they're on a mild losing streak right now. And now they don't have John Sterling calling their games. But that is your power rankings. And we are going to take a look at that every week and see who's going up and who's going down. And I'll be doing that along with the summer score once we get past Memorial Day. Well, we said goodbye to two people. And one died a few, uh, I guess a month or so ago. And I didn't realize their death until I received something in the mail from my cousin Dave. And also an all-time A's great passed away. Are you struggling to close deals? Business to business selling is tougher than ever. And that's why I want to tell you about LinkedIn Sales Navigator. LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a sales intelligence platform that helps professionals effectively prospect and engage high value customers, drive higher revenue and increase sales performance. Sales Navigator helps you target the right buyers, surface key signals such as job changes or which accounts you should prioritize and shows you hidden allies so you can find those buyers that are most likely to convert. Fueled by LinkedIn's 1 billion member platform, Sales Navigator gives you the most up-to-date first-party data enabling to help you unlock conversations with the people that matter. Right now, you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get a 60-day free trial at linkedin.com slash locked on. That's linkedin.com slash locked on for a 60-day free trial. Let LinkedIn Sales Navigator help you feel like a superstar today and sell like one too. Just go to linkedin.com slash locked on to get started. Hey, here's a reminder. The Locked On has launched the first ever National Sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, and it's now available on the Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Day is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local extras of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channel app. So... I pay tribute to Ken Holtzman on today's episode of Locked on A's. I've been pinch hitting there. And Ken Holtzman was an all-time great Oakland A. He started game one of the World Series in 1972, 73, and 74. Years the A's won all three of those World Series. He was a great pitcher and an all-star through multiple no-hitters and won more games as a pitcher than any Jewish pitcher in baseball history. Yes, more than Sandy Koufax. But... Uh, here my uh, obituary gave to him on uh, the locked on A's. Uh, I, I did not realize that this person died until I received this from the uh, Wall Street Journal from my cousin David. And uh, Dave sent me this, that Arthur D'Angelo died. Uh, Arthur D'Angelo was a, a native of Italy. He was born in the, the Abruzzo region of Italy. And he immigrated to Boston when Mussolini came into town. And he was in, he was born in 1926. And when Mussolini took control in the late 30s, his family moved to Boston. He wound up working as a riveter 
in World War II, and he and his brother, he had a twin brother, and the two of them had a laundry service that they had in Massachusetts. And they did, it looks like they were one of these people who had lots of uh, different jobs, Henry and Arthur D'Angelo. And eventually, it was his twin brother, Henry, eventually they found a way to, especially when the popularity of the Red Sox was starting to get higher and higher, you know, in the Ted Williams era, but certainly after the impossible dream season of 1967, they started selling baseball merchandise. Now, one thing that baseball has dropped the ball in over the year in a way that football did spectacularly in the 1960s, football learned how to sell merchandise. Everyone wore football jerseys, hats, and everything, whether they liked the teams or not, starting in the 60s. That was the intelligence of Pete Rozelle. Baseball didn't get on board, but it was people like Arthur D'Angelo and his twin brother, Henry, who decided to start selling merchandise just outside of Fenway Park. Mainly Red Sox, but other things as well. And when people came out of the game at Fenway Park, they would go to their store. Because they were twins, they called their store Twins Enterprises. I used to go to Twins Enterprises as a kid. And in fact, for a couple of years, my family lived overseas in Europe when I was in third and fourth grade. And when asked, what did I miss most about living in Massachusetts? I would say, Twins Enterprises. When we came back to America in 1982, after living in Europe for a couple of years, one of the first places I wanted to go was Twin en Twins Enterprises. Every time I would go to games at Fenway Park, I couldn't wait to go to Twins Enterprises after the game. And there were a bunch of times in the off season or when the Red Sox weren't even playing. I made sure I'd go to Twins Enterprises. It's a difficult thing to comprehend if you come from the age of buying stuff online and things are available on a click. And I am not saying we go back to this, okay? I love that if you see, I have several shirts from different, you know, this is, this is from my kids' little league, but like I have team shirts and they can be delivered right to your home. I don't want to go back to having to go to a store to do it. I understand it's a form of progress. But as a kid, when I would go into their store with the merchandise, it was like going to Willy Wonka's factory. It was magical because it was everywhere. And it wasn't just Red Sox stuff. This is what you have to understand. It wasn't just Red Sox hats and jerseys. It was primarily, I mean, Red Sox obviously dominated. It was right across the street from Fenway. But they had every hat. They had this colossal row of row after row after row of hats. And I remember the first time I went there, I must have been nine or ten years old. Maybe I was even younger. And I was looking at them, this sea of hats. There were Red Sox hats, of course. There were Yankee hats and A's hats and other hats as well. And there were every kind of hat, but not only all the current hats, the older hats too. They had Brooklyn Dodger hats. They had New York Giant hats. They had St. Louis Browns and Washington Senators hats. They had also the old Philadelphia A's and Kansas City A's. The Boston Braves and the Boston Bees, when for a while they were called the Bees. And I remember going there and they got a giant shipment of new hats. And you know what they were? Seattle Mariners hats. And they were the one with the trident, but they opened up. It was a new shipment of hats. They, the Mariners were changing for the trident to the trident with a star around it. And I remember watching them unpack that. They had uniforms out there. They had the satin warm-up jackets. They had yearbooks, not just from the Red Sox, but other teams as well. And I would sometimes just go there and have my jaw dragging along the floor looking at all of this. There were hats I didn't even comprehend. And one thing that my parents used to get from me and from my brother growing up is they had a form of a pullover uniform. It wasn't a t-shirt, but it wasn't like, it was kind of a double ply, uh, I can't describe the fabric, but for your every team. 
And I, that became a thing at Christmas time and my birthday. I'd have a Mets jersey. I'd have an Expos jersey. I'd have a Dodgers jersey. And the hat to go with it. And of course, these were the trucker hats. You know, they weren't like the, the game-worn hats you know, that, that, that had the adjustable cap. But I would go into school making sure if I had my Dodger jersey, I'd have a Dodger hat. If I had my Oriole jersey, I'd have my Oriole hat. And if you wanted to, they'll even put a number on the back. So my Astros uniform had 50 for J.R. Richard. Now you can get everything online. Now you can get everything at the snap, and I don't want to go back. But I have to pay tribute to the man who he and his twin brother gave me and so many other Red Sox fans such a wonderful place to go to, a magical place to go to. In the obituary, he talked about how he still kept doing the work all throughout there, and I guarantee I talked to him not realizing he was one of the twins of Twins Enterprises. It's a magical place. I'm going to go to back east again pretty soon, and I'm going to see if Twins Enterprises is still there. There used to be the Lansdowne shop, which was the official store for the Red Sox that was part of Fenway Park. And I remember I went in there after a game, and it was all Red Sox stuff, and they had great stuff. But I remember thinking... This is no Twins Enterprises. So rest in peace, Arthur D'Angelo. And thank you for creating, quite frankly, a magical, magical experience for me. I remember going there in 1990, in 1995, and in 2002. It became a pilgrimage every single time. Oh, by the way, uh, before we skedaddle, there's two quick things here. Um, one of our commenters here is from Australia. Moz from Oz says, what city team would a 2004 World Series mean the most to? My pick would be Detroit, Pittsburgh. It pains me to say the Yankees. Well, guess what? We'll talk about that tomorrow. I'm going to pick the team that this will mean the most to, and it may surprise you. Do you know why? I haven't figured it out yet. Today's trivia question is going to the birthday boy today, which is Bruce Bochy. Bruce Bochy, who is the manager of the defending World Series champion, Texas Rangers, obviously won with the Giants. If he wins one more, he'll have five World Series titles, which will tie him for the third most all time. Which great manager will Bruce Bochy tie if the Rangers repeat as World Series champions, put the answers right down there. Locked on MLB pods and Twitter, Instagram, or here on YouTube. Paying tribute to the man who gave me, quite frankly, one of my favorite places on earth. And also honoring someone who called what my least favorite team, but did it with a flair. This has been Locked On MLB. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully.